As Jeff said, my name is uh, Jim McGill. I'm a technical solution architect at Mutual of Omaha. And uh, I made it my move from the mainframe world to the Java world uh, by switching to the project we're going to talk about now. Was there to learn Java, ended up learning Groovy, classic bait and switch. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Scott and I uh, put uh, worked on a project that uh, became the uh, group insurance's rating and pricing engines at Mutual of Omaha. Scott was one of the lead architects on that project, so I'm going to talk to him first about how, what choice, why we picked Groovy and how we developed that. And after that, I stuck around and supported it while he went off to greener pastures, as these consultants do. So I will share with you, and he'll, uh, he'll quiz me about how that worked out for us, uh, how that, those choices worked out for us between the time we went into production and, and our current environment. So, uh, and uh, my partner in crime, Scott Hickey, is from Object Partners. Uh, so Scott, I will start us off with a, uh, a low ball, or a, an easy one. Um, uh, well, I'll set the stage. In 2005, when we were starting this project, um, there was no, Gro Groovy was two years away from their 1.0. I went back and looked, and it, it if you look at the historical polls you can make, it, it's Groovy 1.0 beta 9. But it wasn't 1.0 beta 9 at that point because they had no idea when they were going to be 1.0. They didn't know what the, I think it was named like 0 0.5 or something at that point, but I could be wrong. And uh, um, uh, there was no plug-in support in any of the IDEs. Uh, and Groovy had been dormant as, a, as an open source project for a while, but around 2003, 2004, had been regaining traction. Is my, if uh, uh, Guillaume had come on as the project lead and a, lot of, and a couple of other uh, really passionate developers had started to, uh, re uh, to move Groovy forward, and there was a real burgeoning community that was uh, very passionate about Groovy in the open source community. And with that, Scott, can you tell us how Groovy came to Mutual? Yeah. and. Uh... Just to clarify a little bit, I do remember some of this because I was involved in the Groovy decision making. Um, it was kind of interesting because Groovy, way back when, it's hard for people to remember this. It's, Groovy's almost become, you know, not that controversial to or that cutting edge anymore. It feels like it's accepted. But back then, um, there was someone who had started it, um, uh, James Strachan, or Strachan, I believe is how you pronounce his name, and. Um, they had gone to the beta, and then they decided they wanted to make it part of a JSR. And in order to do that, there was a decision that was made to say, we, know, we shouldn't have a custom parser, we should use an antler parser. And the whole decision around that and the JSR fractured whatever momentum there was in that community. I mean, people really got mad. They were bitter. And there's still people today. There are blogs where people are really bitter about what happened there. And like Jim said, it was really great because um, uh, the, there was a project manager that uh, went ahead and, and kind of took the project on and really moved it forward. So they basically started over again. They got to beta 9, and then they started over with this new antler. Uh, Parser ended up going back to like a, a release candidate one, and it took two years to work through this. So there was, the, and the point behind all this is there was a lot of controversy back then. We got to the decision because the system that we were building was designed to replace a 15 or 18 year old Fox Pro app that the actuaries had written and maintained over time. And the goal was to have an integrated group insurance sales system that would handle everything from contact management all the way up through closing sales, publishing uh, the documents that get published and booklets that get produced when you actually sell group insurance. And the, there were you know, I don't know, six or eight different systems that were loosely connected but didn't really share data very well. Uh, and so this system was designed to replace it, and the decision was, we're going to write this new system in Java. And the actuaries were looking at it going, well, what does that mean for us? They own the algorithms that generate the rates. They're accountable to state insurance boards for those rates. The last thing they wanted to do was give up control over how those algorithms worked and, um, and so the, the challenge was, and, and really they were the ones in charge. They were, they were writing the check. 
And so there was a lot of controversy around how can they still keep their hands in being able to define and maintain those algorithms and not have to go through a change request process and have to explain to someone who might be a really bright Java programmer but won't have a clue about what they're trying to do. And that's not hypothetical. There's code. I know, I don't know if Jim had this experience. I know there's code that I wrote that I did what they asked me to do and I can't tell you why it works. <laughs> They're like, we need this to happen and you have to loop six times. Why six? You know, because we'll get close enough to the right answer by then. I, I'm not sure why. They know, I guess that's why they're actuaries and, and we're not. But the, the last thing that they wanted was to try to have to work through a change request process. And as a developer, I mean, I understood that. You know, it's, I, being on the receiving end of that is no fun. It takes forever to take complicated requirements and you're gonna get it wrong and you're gonna go back and you can just see this, this cycle of pain that's gonna incur, be incurred. And the thing is, as a developer, we're not gonna know if, if we got it right, <laughs> if, we, if we're not a domain expert in that field. So anyway, the goal was let's find a, let's find a way to integrate something that, that lets them specify the algorithms in a Java ecosystem. And there, but they were not going to be allowed to program it in Java, and really they didn't want to. So we did a proof of concept with several different languages. I mean, and this sounds kind of funny now, but back at, at the time it made sense. There was like a kind of a bake off of take a non-trivial algorithm and code it up. They wanted to try to code stuff up in SQL stored procedures, uh, which, you know, I mean, looking back on it now, I knew that wasn't a good idea at the time, and knowing what I know now, it would have been a, it would have been a disaster. Um, there was a proposal to do something in JavaScript. There was a proposal to do it in Java. And then I, I was really striving to find a language that would integrate with the JVM that supported math um, in, in, a, in an intuitive way. Um, and so Groovy was the only language I could find on the JVM that used big decimal by default. And, and that was a really big deal. Um, it was a, a big deal for the actuaries, and I knew it was a big deal for us as programmers, because the math has to be right. Um, the, one of the actuaries did a, um, a um, kind of a demonstration for me in Excel, and they showed me what happens if you're, um, if you represent a number in, uh, well, let me back up for a second. So not every, not every decimal number can be represented in binary. So this is a little bit technical, but hopefully seeing some nods. I, and uh, so if you're gonna do business math, you really should not be using floats or doubles. You need to be using a big decimal number or the number's gonna be off. And they did a spreadsheet example where if, you, if you're off by tenths of a, of a percent or whatever, and you do this over 500 person group, over a year's worth of premium, you're off hundreds of dollars. So the, the, it, it's a real problem, it's not a hypothetical problem. And I just felt like as a programmer who had built large systems before, I could see, I mean there was, the neon sign was flashing, right? This is gonna come back and haunt people and they're not gonna even know it's wrong until it's too late. And um, so I felt like having big decimal by default was a really important feature in a language. And I'd used a language called Rex before and, and had good luck with it. And we tried different things. Anyway, long story short, we did a bake-off, showed the code examples, the actuaries. It was, I mean, it, it took like five minutes to make a decision. They looked at the, circle, uh, the SQL stored procedures and went, oh my God, that's what that's going to look like. They looked at Java. And really, JavaScript didn't look any better because JavaScript does not have big decimal support by default. The code looked almost identical to Java. It just wasn't gonna buy them anything. And the Groovy, they read it. They could look at it and actually, without any training, they could understand you know, what the code was doing. And so they said, yep, that's, that's the one we want. And that's how we ended up with Groovy. Um, it's kind of interesting because um, I'll see blogs where people will kind of rip on consultants about wanting to pull in a language like Groovy because it's the cool thing and they're gonna leave this um, company with this niche technology that nobody can support and the only reason why it went into a project is because some consultant thought it would be a cool thing to do and you know for, certainly for this project nothing was further from the truth you know it was the only thing that would work and not only that I thought I was sinking my career 
<laughs> I mean, they had hired me to do this. I'm a Java J2EE guy, right? I'm, I'm thinking JSPs, servlets. I'm trying to figure out how I get my next job when this consul uh, consulting contract's done. And I'm looking at what my resume is going to look like. And I'm not going to have any of that, those bullet points that people want when they hire. I, I was really dreading it. So it was definitely not something uh, that I was picking because I thought it was cool. It was like I, I was trying to do right by the client. And that was the only thing I could come up with at the time. And, uh, and that's, how, uh, that's how we ended up. That's the long story of how we got it into the, into the project. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about some of the requirements? Can you talk a little bit about some of the requirements for the system in terms of, you know, not from a, we did Groovy, but what, what it means to have the rating and pricing engine? What, is, what does that do? Um, at, its, um, at its core, it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, uh, I mean, conceptually, I guess, at the 100,000 foot level, what happens is uh, when they're going to calculate group insurance premium, if they're trying to sell a group, um, they're going to get a census full of people, and people have attributes like gender, age, salary, um, you know, there's, there's, I think, I don't know, 30 or 40 attributes. And then each of those attributes have a rate associated with them. So they have these rate tables, and then for each person, for a given product, uh, these numbers are basically multipliers, there's some base rate, and then everything either moves by, gets multiplied by 1.1 or 0.9, and you end up with um, a lot of calculations. So on a, I, I know there was, I don't remember if it was a 500 person group or a 5,000 person group, but I remember uh, being shocked at the fact that this engine that we created produced about 300 or 400,000 computations to come up with a single rate for one group. So it's, it's very computationally intense. There's a lot of detail in those, in those calculations. That would be 500 people. Maybe a 500 person, and there were 5,000 5, person groups that, that needed to be rated. So performance was an issue for us as well, although at this point we weren't, we weren't trying to solve that problem. We were just trying to you know, pick a tool that the actuaries could use that would integrate, again, with the, the Java ecosystem. And really this engine sat inside of a J2EE app, so there was a Eclipse rich client platform application that would make a call via EJB that basically wrapped what we built it would pass in people, it would pass in the product information, and we would give back um, rates, uh, a, a very large collection of rates, and those would get stored. And that, that looked like your typical, you know, they were using Hibernate to, to save the data back. And, um, but it was a complicated app. The, the, the Eclipse Rich Client application had about as many views and perspectives as Base Eclipse. So it's, it's, it, was a, it was a pretty complicated app. Okay, so you've got this mission critical app that we're coding in Groovy. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the development team you had to, to support <laughs> this big Java project. So this was great. This is a multi-million dollar, multi-year project. Um, it was being run by um, actually a different company, uh, a large company that I won't name that um, operates globally and provides services. and. Uh, they were running the whole project except for the rating engine. When they looked at what it would take to rewrite this engine, they had people in every single part of the project except for this one part. They wanted nothing to do with having, being responsible for converting this. And to ensure our team's success, um, this, right, this is a Java app. Um, I was the tech lead. I'd been coding in Java seven or eight years, I probably had, you know, 20 years worth of coding experience. I, I had some experience. But to ensure the, su the success, they gave me Jim, who at the time, um, uh, after his career as an attorney, he was doing DB2 COBOL for, mainframe COBOL, mainframe COBOL for five years. Five years. And another person who had about 12 years of coding experience, but most of it was in VB, and, and, uh, and he had, I think, about maybe a year's worth of Java experience. So that was the team that they initially assembled to build this critical part of the heart of a mission critical app that was going to cost millions of dollars and take several years. And uh, you know, it was just amazing looking at it. I'm, I'm think, I, I was shocked. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what did I step into? Um, and um, the, uh, 
the great thing is we did have a, we had a great project manager. We had a great um, uh, ISM or software development manager. Um, the members of the team were really good. They were really open-minded and that, and you know, that was as important as any amount of uh, programming experience that I think it turns out. Um, we, luckily we had, um, this is your dream in Agile, right? Is you want a customer who's engaged, a subject matter expert who's part of the team. We had that, it was awesome. We had three people who had written the Fox Pro code working with us from day one. And that was huge. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to overstate how important that was. And it also made the project really fun. Um, and people might not think actuaries are fun. Um, you know, maybe relative to accountants, they look great. You know, I don't know. But, but they were, they were, you know, from a, from a technical perspective, they were an awesome customer. I mean, they, they were really great. Um, so, um, yeah, that was, that was our dream team. Um, so it, it didn't look like a dream team at the time, but it, it, actually, it actually turned out to be really good. So mutual, ex mutual, we buy into Groovy, but we definitely, we, there were reservations at the time and, and legitimate ones. Can you talk about some of the things we were concerned about with Groovy as we started down that path? Um, you know, there, there were definitely concerns, uh, that, you know, there were concerns about open source for one. I mean, in any big company, and I think this is a little bit easier to deal with now, but it's still a challenge. I mean, if you work for a company of any size and you pull in a technology, at some point up the managerial chain, somebody's gonna ask who provides support for that. And, you know, the problem with a lot of open source tools is, you know, there is, there is no answer for that, and at the time there definitely wasn't. There was, you know, right now, Groovy is run by Pivotal, which was spun off by VMware, which contains Spring Source and the Groovy ecosystem and Tomcat and TC server. So it all looks really great right now, but back then, you know, there was nothing. There were, you know, a handful of guys in Europe that were the core committers on it. That was all there was to, to it. Um, so that was definitely a concern. There were some, there were concerns about tooling. So there, at the time, there was no Groovy Eclipse plugin. It had been started and, and stopped and, um, you know, there was just basic ant support uh, to compile and build. Um, so we had tooling concerns, we had support concerns we had to work through. Um, it's a dynamic language, so it's not gonna catch a lot of things at compile time. Things can compile fine and break at runtime. time. I, the, the compiler is, you know, I don't know what, 100 times better now than it was when we first started in terms of giving you really good feedback. But at the time, if you had a runtime error, you got a stack trace that was, you know, a mile long. Um, and, and so there was, you know, issues around that as well. But definitely the tooling, um, the maturity of the language as well were concerns. What were some of the mitigating factors that made us feel better about it? Uh, can you talk, I'm thinking in, in particular about the community, even though it was small, can you talk about some of the support we got? Yeah, so, so at, at some point, you know, there was a decision made that we're gonna move forward. And, and really it was the actuary saying, you know, if there's a better choice, show me. And if there's not, let's get going. And, and so there was a lot of tension. But once we did get going, there were great things that we discovered. And one of them was how, how phenomenal the Groovy community is. And I'd worked with open source before, but not to the extent that I was using uh, something like Groovy. I mean, we were really pushing the edges at the time. Um, it was my understanding that this was the largest project probably other than Grails itself. Um, uh, that was using Groovy. And so we were, you know, we were definitely interfacing with the team. We had lots of questions. We had questions about performance. We were really lucky that uh, one of the committers, John Wilson, uh, on the project came over for a couple weeks from England and worked with us, helped us work through some issues around performance, and just helped us understand kind of how to think in Groovy. And it's hard to put a price on what that experience was like, working with somebody who was that close to the project and, and that good of a, a person to work with and have as a mentor. I mean, I, th I think Jim would agree. I mean, it was, it was really a treat um, to be able to work with someone that, that bright and, and that nice and, and that good of a communicator. And he, what he did really represented what we saw with the rest of the community. Anytime we had problems, we would post something on a ma mail list, we'd get a response back right away. Um, 
and that was, that was really good. And when we found bugs, we, we were actually uh, regression testing. So we had a big test suite. <clears throat> we did, our code base was about half Groovy code and half, um, I mean, sorry, half application code and half test code. So we, we were writing tests from day one. And that's, you know, to, to Jim's credit and the other team's members' credit, you know, they were willing to buy into, we're going to write code and write tests from day one. In 2005, yeah. was this one of the first big test-driven developments at Mutual? Yes, definitely. And it, it was one of the first ones. I, I had done some on a, on a previous project, but not to this extent. Um, so, but I had a taste of it enough to know that it, it was the right thing to do. And also, I was scared enough of Groovy at the time, honestly, that there was no way I was going to write code and not write tests. And, and that's the honest truth. You know, I had never used a dynamic language before, so I had, so, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't one of these people that's looking at this from kind of a ivory tower going, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm this language expert and I have no fear of anything. I was scared to death like everybody else. I love my compiler with my compiler errors and now you're going to take me from this statically typed language into a thing that, you know, compiles and doesn't blow up till runtime. I was terrified um, of it. It turned out in the end that those fears, I don't think, I think they were not founded. And I didn't, I didn't understand at the time that, you know, really we need to be testing all of our code, whether it's compiled or not. And, and uh, you know, especially in an application this complicated. So, can you talk a little bit about uh, what we actually ended up putting in and how, how that worked as we went into production? Oh, wait, uh, um, I'm sorry, readability it's not a particularly technical talk. We're talking about the benefits to an enterprise of adopting Groovy. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, because one of the things that we're going to focus on, or I am again and again, is just readability because with Groovy you get a lot of the, uh, the scaffolding that Java requires out of the way and what benefits that provides. And so, can, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about that as I fl uh, put a couple of examples up? Yeah, this is, um, this is really interesting. Um, the, you know, I think we all work on projects and we, you know, we all say readability is really important, right? Because we know it, it's going to matter in maintenance. But then you get the pressures of a project and you're told to cram out code fast and you never get a chance to refactor and you don't have time to do code reviews. And you know, everyone says they care about how the, the code reads and it seems like sometimes that gets pushed to the side. What was really interesting about our project is um, we weren't getting paid just to produce working code. You know, we, we, our code had to do what the old Fox Pro system did. We weren't supposed to try to change how they were doing business. We just needed to change the, the, the technology. But that wasn't the only deliverable. The deliverable was a readable code base that the actuaries could maintain, modify, and run tests over. And so that really, uh, that was really great because um, I'd never experienced that before. I didn't have such a focused mindset as we did um, on this project. I've never had that before where, you know, the readability of the code was a critical deliverable. We had to show the actuaries the code. If they couldn't understand it, we had to explain it. And sometimes we, I don't think that often, but there were times when we, you know, I guess violated a best practice for a Java programmer to keep the code readable for the actuaries. And at the end of the day, you know, we struggled with that, but at the end of the day, we said, well, wait a minute, our deliverable is a readable code base for the audience that, that's you know, going to maintain it. And we don't get to pick what they think is readable. They get to pick what's readable, right? I mean, if, if we're truly customer focused on this, we need to give them something that makes sense to them. And if they want to change it later, if they come and become a, maybe, I don't want, enlightens the wrong word, um, but you know, if, <laughs> but you know, I mean, you get to best practices because over time, right, you, you figure out if I do X instead of Y, I'm going to be happier in the end, but sometimes it's a process to get there. But, and it, but you have to go through that. You have to experience some pain to know, okay, well maybe I'll make, I'll add a little complexity to make things better. But, in, and sometimes we took, like I said, some of those best practices out. Um, but the thing that was really great is uh, that I had a, this, this really sold me on Groovy, was when I could see the code read like what the actuaries were talking about. And that's, that was really awesome. So if we look at 
Um, yeah, we can go back a little bit. So, you know, we talked about, you know, these are group insurance uh, calculations. So there's a, a, what they call a census, which is just the, the people that are going to get rated. So here we have in, um, a, a class called product rate calc. And we're going to create this product output based on some input. And um, in the, the computations that we were talking about are these plan factors. So these factors, these multipliers that move a rate up and down. You, you end up collect, getting a collection of them. And so what this is really code, what this code is doing, and this is not hard to read, we're saying for each plan design, so basically a, a, a product design that you're gonna sell, you're gonna provide some uh, group life insurance and it'll have some riders on it of some kind, say, or, or features that are enabled. So for each one of these plan designs, we're gonna go ahead and um, let's see here. We're gonna. We're How gonna, about if I take? It's yeah, been a while. Take, take, yeah, this has been a while. But this it, is where I'll make the switch, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and I want to, uh, and I'm glad because otherwise I was gonna come back and caveat it. You're not gonna see any actual code from uh, our rating or pricing engines, even even at a high level. <clears throat> not that it would matter so much, just taken out in its uh, in its thing. But we we promise to sanitize. But this is. This is sanitized code, but this is not pseudocode. This stuff, if the, if, the, uh, if the other methods were there and everything, this would run as is. So if we have a life insurance product and they've been offered two or three plan designs, so we have plan options. So we've got, say, three plan designs. And for each one of those, we're pulling all the members that are signing up for a particular plan design because we'll have a list of people and they'll be assigned to one of the three plans unless it's one of the types where you can be assigned to multiple plans. It's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated app. Um, but we go ahead and we identify uh, the, the, the members that belong to a particular plan uh, or the census information. And from that, we generate our member list. And from that, we calculate factors at a member level. And from that, we roll some of that up into a plan factor level. And then we start to calculate expenses at a plan factor memo. And once we've got all our plan factors, we try to get stuff at the group level. And if we had code back here, we'd be sending stuff back down to the member level and rationalizing some of the member level stuff we've calced based on that. And even at that level, what I've described is extremely oversimplified for what this application does. So. Um, but here you can, uh, I'll let Scott talk again about some of the app, how the math would read. But notice what's great here is you don't see type information, so you don't know what these types are, and you don't know, you don't see anything like try catch blocks. And for the actuaries, that's huge. So this might not make sense to you, but every one of these variable names is a business term for them. And it's really collections of people and collections of, of, of uh, numbers. And, and they, can give these collections whatever name they want, and there's no other noise in the code. And that, that I, I'd never seen that before. I, I, so this, this is really was a turning point for me with Groovy, at least. Go ahead. <clears throat> and so here's a great example of, um, you know, because we have operator overloading in Groovy, all of these are big decimal values or big integers, and I can use plus, minus, divide, just like, it, it reads just like you would write it up in a requirements calc. You know, I've got the premium minus this amount. I don't know what type, per, I don't even remember what all this stuff is, but it doesn't matter, right? The, the actuaries know what this means. And, when, and what was great, and I'd never experienced this before, I remember being in a meeting and uh, we were trying to match the old system to the new, and there was a, a calculation that was off, and one of the actuaries says, that just doesn't make sense. Let me look at that calc. And it was kind of funny, he goes, well, that's not how we calculate bill and uh, claim cost. Like, duh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's great. But what was awesome is he could read it, and he could tell me right from the code that it was wrong, and it was obviously wrong. And it's like, we dream of that, right? I mean, as developers, we would, I mean, that's, that is, it doesn't get any better than that, right? To have a customer actually look at the real code, not your explanation of the code, to tell you you got it wrong. And the logic errors, and when, you, when that happened, that also made me realize that, you know, we worry about compilation errors and, and strong typing, <coughs> or dynamic typing, I should say, versus statically typing. Um, and, uh, 
you know, the, the, those types of errors are dwarfed by trying to track down what's wrong in this formula. I mean, this is the stuff that we waste, you know, right, hours, days, you know, because this isn't, you know, we're never looking at this by itself. We're, you know, this is buried somewhere else in some process, and, we, and we've got a, a JIRA ticket issued, and, and somebody's mad because they know it's wrong, and we're trying to figure out what's wrong with this. It's great when you have code that readable. And that, uh, that really, again, that was like a turning point for me to realize, you know, where do I really spend my time? Once the code's all running, we spend all of our time fixing the logic errors, not, not compilation errors, not runtime errors. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Yeah. No, no. So it was still this. So this was still participating in your standard Java, you know, application development lifecycle. So they're, you know, they're checking the code into version control. It gets built on a cruise. Well, at the time, got built on a cruise control server. All the tests, regression tests, were run. At some point, it would get packaged up on a certain night of the week and get deployed. So, yeah, it wasn't. We weren't trying to implement real time changes. Um, in, into that. And by the way, the, I, I guess we should have started with this. The intent behind this whole talk is, uh, is make it as interactive as possible, so please ask questions. Um, Jim and I did not script out a whole lot f with the intent of hoping that people would, would ask questions. So um, yeah, please, please ask away. <clears throat> so Scott, can you talk about what we deployed in 2008? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what was interesting is um, we, we definitely produced a system that matched the old. We did, uh, not only did we try to duplicate the behavior by looking at the existing code, but we actually took a year's worth of data for the four product lines they had, ran it through the old system, basically did a, a, a data conversion because it was being modeled a new way in the new system converted it into the new system, ran it through the new system, wrote tools that would automatically compare the old to the new, and um, where the rates didn't match, that's when we knew we had bugs. And we just kept working through that, working through that. So even though this was considered the most volatile, or, or, or you know, hard, the hardest part of the system to get right, um, we actually finished ahead of a lot of the other project, and we developed something that was that was rock solid. And we actually had people from other teams, when things didn't work out right, they would come back to us and help, ask us to help troubleshoot. And um, if, for instance, if a calculation wasn't coming through correctly, we knew, because we were proving every time we checked in code that the old system matched the new, if something wasn't being computed correctly on a screen, they probably weren't passing in the data correctly. So it was probably, you know, what we were getting wasn't accurate, because we had proof that what we, you know, once the data got into our engine, we knew it was accurate, we could, we could prove it. And so we actually kind of became a sounding board or a, we kind of became a tool for the other parts of the app uh, for validating their code. We ended up with about, um, so we had um, a really versatile test harness that we had built and used all along the way. So we not only wrote code and unit tests, but we also wrote this validation tool that grew over time and actually became an app for the app. Uh, so to speak, and um, and it was continued to be used, um, some form of it, um, because once you went into production, one of the things the actuaries want to do is they want to change the rates going forward. They want to be, um, this was one of the business reasons for doing this. If a new uh, competitor introduces a feature on life insurance and they want to implement that, it might have taken, I don't know what the numbers were, six months or nine months to get the old system changed from beginning to end. Well, they wanted to make those changes in a week. And so, but if they're going to make a change, they need to know what happens to the whole book of business. So, so you know, there's kind of a, a saying, the actuaries don't have to be right, they have to be right on average. And <laughs> unfortunately, coding isn't that way. But, but the point is, is that whenever they're going to change how they think about their business, they can make a rule change, but they really need to see what the impact is to the whole, the whole book of business. And so we really not only delivered a working engine, but we gave them a way to test and experiment with changes, which they didn't really have 
a great way of doing before easily. Um, we had about 45,000 lines of source code. About half of it was application code and half of it was test code. Um, I, I don't know if that's a good ratio or a bad ratio for you know, a, a test-driven system, um, but it, it, it seemed good. We, weren't, we didn't feel like we were overburdened with tests. We felt like we were testing the right stuff. And it wasn't unit tests. Just, I mean, it right, was yeah, the hard. I mean, yeah, this, hard. this is unit tests, integration tests, anything that... Well, and the whole harness, the AD, you know, the, yeah, the, 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 the ETL test harness as well. Yep. Um, so this is, uh, so Jim, thank you very much for putting the slides together. Um, at one point, at least, with one of the product lines, I remember we were, we had like 99% of the groups rating in less than a second. So it was interesting, we, you know, performance was this huge problem when we knew we were producing hundreds of thousands of computations. Um, but in fact, and, and this shouldn't be a surprise, right? You know, where, where's the bottleneck? It's gonna be in network and database IO, right? It's still gonna dwarf. So for all the concerns that you see on mail lists and everything else about, oh, you can't use that dynamic language, it's too slow. You know, Java does this computation or this, this thing 100 times faster than Groovy. Doesn't matter, right? I mean, in, in the big picture of things, even, even on the old version of Groovy, which the new one is, is many times faster, um, and actually with static typing supported now with Groovy, you can get to two Java speeds if you want to get there. Um, it didn't matter. Even with the, the Groovy 1.0, it just, we were, we were plenty fast. From a web click perspective, we could do those computations. The hard part was saving, you know, what's, what's it gonna take to do several hundred thousand Hibernate inserts, right? That's, that's gonna dwarf what we did. Have they kept up on the test coverage? <clears throat> we'll get to that, but yes. Um, the short answer is yes and no. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a short answer. The explanation for the yes and the no takes a little longer. Um, unit test wise, we were never as strong unit test wise as, as the day we went in in 2008. But <clears throat> harness wise, which is how we really measure where we're at, where our ability to rerun an entire block of business for a product, not just the stuff we've sold, but anything we've tried to sell uh, in production since 2008, and see where we stand with the latest code base in terms of any new exceptions being thrown, but way more than that, what are the rates? What are we doing in this particular area? What does the Northwest look like with these new rates or anything like that? Um, that we have very much kept up to date on and um, and unfortunately for us, because we were in WebSphere, uh, we were uh, a particular version of WebSphere until just this January, we were tied to Java 1.4, uh, which meant that we were, uh, we were uh, level set at Groovy 1.55 from, from about 2008 to 2000, the end of 2013. Um, and so many of the huge advances that Groovy was going through, we were not getting the benefit of until just recently. But even with that, our performance was okay, our testing times were okay, um, and, uh, and we were able to perform. Even moving up to new JVMs with the existing Groovy 155 gave us huge performance boosts. Uh, and that's really like a that. credit, um, that's a huge credit to the Groovy team. Um, and I, I don't know how many folks here are involved in open source projects, but if you are, I'm sure one of the, the conversations that happens on every open source project is we're coming out with a new version. What version of Java do we need to support? And almost always the answer that I see is it's gonna be the latest one. And you know, you get in like in the case of Groovy, you'll get people that would say things like, you know, we just need to support Java 7 because um, anybody that's using Groovy is gonna be current anyway. And, and if, not, if not, they should be, you know? Which is easy to say, except that the reality is, and, and, I, and I, I think this is perfectly valid, is, you know, it's a big deal for big companies with a big infrastructure to manage uh, a Java infrastructure stack, right? And it's, you can kind of flippantly say, oh, you should just upgrade to Java 7. But when you look at what those infrastructure people have to do, to pull that off, it's, it's typically a, what, 12-month project, if you're lucky, and not everything converts correctly, 
And there's, there's all kinds of dependencies. I mean, these, it's, it's easy for someone who has the view of, I'm trying to build an open source project to go, oh, that shouldn't be a big deal. But on the user side of it, it really is a big deal. <clears throat> and the, the Groovy community was phenomenally responsive. They were so willing all along the way to not dismiss our concerns about the fact that we were stuck on Java 1.4. And they were using um, uh, something Weaver. Uh, I can't remember now. What the, there's, there's, a, there's a great library that, that people will use to help get backward Java compatibility. And there was pressure. I mean, there were people on the, some people at least in the Groovy community who really didn't want to see, you know, resources wasted and time wasted worrying about that. But it was, it was hu obviously huge to Mitchell of Omaha. And, and any other big co corporate company that, that they actually cared. They, they really truly cared about supporting those existing people. And, uh, and again, that, it just speaks to, you know, what a, what a great, what a great group of people to run a project. I mean, they, they, they truly would listen to people's concerns and, and respond to them. I don't have that. I'm sorry. Uh, the question was how old was, or how large was the old Fox Pro system? Yeah. Um, I don't have that, and, <coughs> pardon me, um, it, it's a, a little bit apples and oranges uh, in terms of, of uh, the Fox Pro uh, script. And it's, it's, that's actually a, a very interesting question. I might ask, I'll go back and ask those guys, not, uh, but uh, we were always comparing it to what it would possibly be like in a, in a more Java, in Java app. Yeah. You know, because we've got 45,000 45, lines when we went into production. I can unish, I can very I can I can I'm embarrassed to say how little of that was comments, uh, but and and I'm also no I'm not I'm not bragging I'm I'm ashamed to say how little of that is comments. Uh, it was not commented as well as it should have been, uh, and no amount of of readability in the code excuses the the lack of comments we had in in many areas. It would be worse if they were commenting, but that is true. That is true. But I the, say congratulations and the no comments part, actually. Yeah. I disagree no. with commenting on code, so... The, the, because the, the code itself should be readable, as you're saying. Because if it's readable and obvious, then you don't need the, the comments. So congratulations on that. I, I, I understand. Uh, for people who might be watching the video and couldn't hear, the, the, the commenter was saying he actually encourages more readable code at the at, at, so as to minimize the need for comments or eliminate the need for comments and i would use the word minimize so because you can't you the code can tell you what you're doing it can't always tell you why you were doing it and so a comment that tells you why you did what you did especially when it's not particularly intuitive uh what you're trying to do can sometimes be very important and those are the kind of comments right yes there. those are they are, they are. And I, I, I'm not saying we should have written War and Peace in our com. But the other thing that's, mi the other thing that's missing with the 45,000 lines that you'd get in a Java app are getters and setters. I mean, when we have 45,000 lines, the parts that aren't comments or, you know, end curly brace lines or whatever are actually doing something f fairly non-trivial. Uh, you, know, you know, obviously a counter or something is is a trivial action, but it's, you know, it's not, we're, these methods are, are bigger than they should be compared to OO because our actuaries thought they grouped their problems into problem sets and they wanted that problem set, even if they were scrolling up and down the page, they wanted that problem set laid out the way they, they expected it. So we'd have several hundred line, uh, several hundred line methods and classes that at times exceeded a thousand lines. Uh, but that was the way they wanted to see that, and that worked for them. And I'll get to, in a minute, some of the problems that might have presented in other ways. But, again, readability from the subject matter expert is super important in, in terms of, of understanding what's going on, minimizing and, and minimizing problems or miscommunications in requirements docs or other places like that, misunderstandings that 
that are travel that are communicated in documentation or between from one person to another to another you know if the code is bigger than we'd like but readable to the people whose whose input we need that was a trade off we were willing to make i, I want to I want to add something about the readability to um, two, two different points. Um, the, I'd worked on large projects before this one, but it was more you know, working on the full stack, um, not just in something that was algorith algorithmic. So when we're talking about 45,000 lines of code, that's not I.O. and that, I mean, there's no database and no screen. So that is, that is just nothing but business logic. Um, and I had never worked on a system that had that much business logic before. So <clears throat> readability, so when a program's too big to fit in your head, um, that's when the readability really matters. And, and one thing that is, it's hard to convey um, in a blog entry when you're trying to compare Java readability to Groovy readability is what that means over the course of a project, again, that's so large that it, it doesn't fit in your head. So one of the things that we experienced back in 05 to 08 is we would have to revisit code that was written 10 months ago, and we didn't even remember you know, what it did. Somebody might ask, well, what, what happens in this part of this uh, disability calculation? It's like, I don't know. I know I wrote it, but that was 10 months ago. And, and again, the system's too big to fit in your head. So having that readability, um, so, the, so the conciseness and expressibility of Groovy really helped us all along the way to kind of be able to go back and reread the code, even with the, whether the comments were there or not. To your point, I mean, it, it, was, it was easier to understand. Uh, the other thing that affected readability that we got lucky on is, um, you know, we were really structuring the code in terms of, it's, it was data structures and, and calculations. And so we, it was definitely not OO. And um, it turned out that actually, uh, again, we got lucky. We really coded in a functional style. And that had huge benefits for us, it, it turned out. So sometimes we ended up with methods that were probably longer than we wanted because, again, the, the actuaries, they didn't want to see it broken up. But more importantly, from a, I think from a readability perspective, um, as we were building out the system, because it wasn't very OO and there was no state, it was really easy to go and you could manipulate a computation and you didn't have to worry about the side effect. You didn't have to worry about, well, if I'm gonna change that, I gotta make sure this object's in this state and this object's in this state and this object's in this state and boy, I hope it all works. And, and I think we've all been there before in really complicated systems where you know, our object model, we're proud of it at one point and then months later we're looking at it going, wow, I just really over-engineered this thing and, and <laughs> I'm not proud of this at all anymore. So we really got lucky, so the readability um, that we, I've, I'm really proud of, of the code base that we had created, and I think it was a combination of Groovy's expressibility and that functional style. And by the way, one of the, the side benefits of that was the testing that we were doing, this regression testing, where we said we're going to run a full year's worth of business um, every time the code changes across four product lines. Obviously, that was taking time, so we decided can we run this in multi-threaded? If I have an eight core computer, could I run it eight wide? And in fact, with almost no code changes, because the, the, the code base was stateless, we were able to, to take um, those regression tests and, and run them at first on four core and then I think eight core machines, or maybe I, I might be getting confused with something else. It was at least four core. Dual dual cores, yeah, yeah okay. four core machines. Okay, two, two dual cores, I guess, at the time. So that, and that was huge, and so that, that was another great you know, side benefit of, of the, the approach that we took. How long does it all the test, regression Well, the, the unit tests, which uh, they run in, um, in a, which our unit tests are not true unit tests, they're also integration tests, because we have such long methods that, that when we had a particular problem with a case, we serialized that out and we'd run that case through, we call, and we call that an integration test. That w so our, our, our unit test suite, which we defined as anything we ran when we ran, automated our unit test run, took uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. But the, like but, running a product line through though, that took, yeah. well, we got it down to, wasn't it like a half hour or at, at the time? Oh, at the time for at that the time. limited. Not, for, not what you're doing now, yeah. but at the time. At the time we got product. it down to about a ha half hour per product when we had, but now we have hundreds of thousands of cases 
per product that we can run through. And so to run those through takes hours and hours and hours. But because of how we've got it set up, we can kick off four quad core machines and divvy up the load, not seamlessly. We have to set some things up to do it that way. But, uh, but we can, so we can, that's we what can you're doing balance. today, right yes. now, right? Yes. Every, yes. Every... every weekend, we rerun our entire block of business uh, uh, using the latest code base we have and the latest set of rules we have. And that load process takes from about Friday night to early Sunday morning, you know. And that actually is a huge improvement over where we were, um, you know, like a year ago with this. We were actually finishing on Sunday night. So we have had to do some performance things. In Agile, everybody, it, testing is important, but everybody says, test what you need to test, you know, find the right level, you know. Because I've asked, I've asked testing experts or agile experts when they come through, you know, do they have any, any recommendations for us on testing? And I tell them that we test about 800,000, you know, cases, you know, or more now. Um, and they're like, well, you should try to pare that down to what you need. And I completely understand that. And so for, for things like whether, you know, our code is going to blow up or not, or we're kicking out proper messages, or, you know, a generic sort of happy path kind of things are working, you know, we can, you know, between one and 10,000 of each product gets us most of the way there. Absolutely. But uh, when Scott said that a 500 person case can generate hundreds of, you know, like two, three, 400,000 uh, calculations, it's actually on the low side. And depending on what product so product uh, selections they've made, what state they're from, what kinds of things. A 500 person case can generate anywhere from probably half a million to uh, three or four million calculations in a single, uh, to, to calculate a single group. Um, it, it also varies by product. And the, the complexity of the calculations that happen, uh, happen by group, because we calculate dozens of things that involve multiple numbers per member multiple times as we roll we roll it several different ways we go through multiple loops uh, handling different kinds of calculations so we say that taking our entire block of business is doing you know a fine just like probably less than one percent of of what the legitimate possibilities are but since that's our actual reality, we consider that a very good code coverage uh, in what we do. But so that's how we get our confidence in, in what we do. And so we don't have, we don't have uh, if we're in a particular method and we've got the unit test for that, you know, the, any particular uh, class that we're changing and we want to see immediately what is it, what's the unit test for that, how, do, how does that work, we can run that in less than a minute. You know, it's the, it, it's the particular integration tests that we've built up over time that make that unit test suite take about 15 or 20 minutes. But that unit test suite, because our methods are big enough, can't cover everything easily. It's just not worth it. Yes? How, uh, how proud is the business of your unit test and integration tests? Do you show them the results and kind of the data sets in and the data sets out? Um, on, uh, the question was, how proud is the, the business of our unit tests? You mean, do they sort of, do they support the l level of effort we've put into testing? And, um, okay, this will, uh, when we were originally, how many people here have been on a major sort of enterprise project? How many people have been on one that went according to schedule and came close to a deadline that was multi-year? I've never... <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been on I've been on at least three major multi-year tens of millions of dollars projects, and I've never come. And we didn't either. He, as Scott said, we were finished before some of the other pieces. We were late too. But um, and and, and we're, I'm getting to the testing. Sorry. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, we Scott said half our stuff is about testing. And when and when deadlines are getting, you know are getting blown past and 
everybody is late, including us. The fact that we're not as late as everybody else doesn't mean we're not also late. And everybody's looking for ways they can show they're tightening the schedule, you know, to say half my stuff is going to be test, you know, is not a popular opinion in certain project manager circles, you know. Uh, but we had people on our side. The first of which was the person who was in, because we weren't testers, we were developing the app. And most of the time, you develop the app, you do unit tests, and you send it on to, you put it in CAT, you put it in SIT, you give it to the testing team, you give it to the quality assurance people, and they do their job to make sure that what you've done. And they even encourage that. If you try to do it all yourself, you violated that sort of separation of, of, uh, of uh, you know, act, what, uh, yeah responsibility thank you uh, and, and that's a red flag you know but when you're dealing with something as complicated as what we have here that even a small case is hundreds of thousands of calculations most of which at the very end we capped at like 12 decimal points but when we're calculating some of these numbers we're taking them out to 30 decimal places and when we remultiply and remultiply and roll those up you get that wrong by not, if you get it wrong at the 32nd dec decimal point, you're going to be okay. But you get it wrong at the fifth decimal point, you're going to be off by dozens of dollars even on a small case. And when you're off on a small case, you, you know, but you've got that many complicated calculations. How do you write test cases for that? Well, you go to the actuaries and you say, I don't know what to put in. What do I put in? And they tell you what to put in. And they tell you what to expect to get out. You know, so the actuaries have now taken their valuable time and not improved the app or run the app or sat there and done that. They've told somebody to, you know, they've given them all these inputs, and there are dozens of them, and they've said, if you do this right and you use this kind of census, we calculated it for you, this is what you should get out. Because they can't use our system to calculate it, because then they're just showing us that our system is doing what our system is doing, not that it's right. You know, and so... At that point, you know, what we're testing are two things. Whether our system is working right and whether a tester can enter a complicated test case correctly, run it correctly, and validate it correctly. And that's where we found with the testing, on, we, we had this suite of like 30, th 30 cases that people would manually enter at the beginning. We found for every one problem they found, we, were, we had 20 to 25 uh, example, it, it, uh, bugs coming in where we identified how that had been misentered or how that census was not quite accurate. Or, you know, because you have, a, you have a 40 person census, you change it to 41, that's wrong. You enter one, you fat finger one zip code wrong in that. That changes the rate and that's off by the, you know, because they're sitting there, well, that should have been $59, not $58.75. Does that matter? A, you know, a tester can't tell that. An actuary can look at that and say, move on, you know, or not. He's like, whoa, you know. Um, and we found actually that even underwriters at that level, you know, I thought, I thought maybe underwriters would have most of that knowledge so that they could see, you know, a, diff a, you know, a difference. A QA person would have to be told exactly what to see. An underwriter could probably spot a 10 or 15% slide that was wrong. Not necessarily, because they're complicated cases. If it doesn't really stand out, like really stand out, either because they've run that case before and know what it was supposed to be, or because we're putting out a seven-figure, you know, we're putting out $20,000 for a three-person case, you know, something like that. Um, the actuaries have all the knowledge as to whether those rates are right or not. And so to test it, they have to go in and run the queries and do the analysis to say these rates are right. Um, and so they were 100% behind this testing code, even when other people were not. And p other people got on board very quickly. But the one person who was always in our side that wasn't in our little circle, the, qual the, quality, the guy who was in charge of testing, because he took one look at that and wanted no part of having to write all those test cases and be the guy that signed off. And he's a sharp guy. He wasn't being a jerk about it or anything. He's like, this is ridiculous. We can't do that. And it never really got past that. I mean, nobody was going to sit there and tell us or the actuaries who everybody wanted the actuaries time. We were fortunate to get it in development because this was their main concern. But 
they were involved in every piece of this. And to have them sit back and babysit the QA process when really all QA was going to do was check with them to what should I input, what should I get out, cut out the middleman, put some queries out there, and, uh, and validate it. And to this day, since 2008, we've had five additional group actuary individuals have, become, have, have been or are now active in the code. As Scott was saying, the actuaries didn't just give us requirements documents. They didn't just give us an Excel spreadsheet with stuff, although that is the closest those guys come to a requirements document is an Excel spreadsheet with the calcs. And, and we put those in and they check them. But they are in the code with us, either pair programming in the beginning or they make code changes as well. Yes? It's, it, it, whether it's the actuary got people or the IS people, the ramp up time on this app is months. But it's not because it's groovy. It's because now we've got, since we've gone into production, we've added three new products. We've, we've radically changed an existing product. Um, we've redesigned how we do renewal processing in our app. Um, we've got 120,000 lines of code and almost none of it is filler. And almost all of it is business rules. I mean, that's an enormous amount of stuff to digest. Uh, and it takes people a while to digest it. And they do it in chunks. Yes? As far as the readability goes and trying to, try to learn how, that, how this works, I guess this is as much a question about the current state of, of tooling. How does Groovy tooling, has it gotten pretty good as far as refactoring? Because, I mean, if you're going to rename something or pull up a method or, you know what I mean? Like, when you start to look at how you want to refactor stuff, I mean, that was at least in the past, that was probably one of the bigger concerns and probably would have been at the time that you started this. Maybe they've gotten better now. But for those of us who might be considering Groovy, how is the tooling now? Uh, the question is, how is the tooling now for Groovy? And how does it, uh, is, and the specific example was a question of how easy is it to refactor? And I'll hand that off to Scott. Okay, I can talk about that. One, I want to, before I answer that question, there was one interesting uh, point about it was a great question, what's the ramp up time? Because that was one of the concerns. And you, and you still hear this today, which is, um, you know, my Java coders are, are barely understanding what they should be doing in Java. If I give them Groovy, you know, how are they gonna possibly be able to understand all of the complexity of, of Groovy, right? Well, um, when we first coded the very first calculation, back in 2005, I, I distinctly remember this moment of, um, it, was, it was one of the simplest things I could do at the time, but I was, I was coding, had a screen full of code, the lead actuary looks over my shoulder, because one of the concerns was, if they're gonna maintain the code, what kind of training is available? And of course, there wasn't any training classes at the time. And he looks over my code and he goes, is that the groovy code? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, he goes, is that the real code? I said, yeah, that, this is, I'm coding up the first you know, iteration or whatever, and he says, well, we don't need to send our people for training for that. I can read that. I mean, and that was all there was to it. I mean, that, it, <laughs> it was like, well, you know, it, it, there were so many things. And even like the testing part, like we, we did luck out because, um, you know, most of the time you would think everybody's going to like pat you on the back, right? You guys did a great job testing. Their attitude was like, you better test it. You know, like we're putting this into production. We're paying you to build this system. I mean, there was, a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like pat on the back. It was like, you better get it right. And we, you know, that's like, like, that's just a given, you know. It's like, you know, you don't get credit for breathing or something. You know? it, 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 was, it, was, it was very interesting. So the, re, yeah, to Jim's point, you know, the Groovy actually helped a lot. You know, the app's really complicated. The, the, the Groovy enables people to understand it, not get in the way. Um, John, your, your question um, was about refactoring. So, um, so uh, there was no Eclipse support when we first started. I was the Groovy Eclipse plugin lead for a couple years um, and did what I could. Um, eventually, the people at Spring Source who had written um, an Aspect J plugin and really understood the internals took it over. The, the plugin is great. You, you can do um, a lot of refactoring that you couldn't do otherwise. But, the, the, but our experience, and this was kind of interesting, the tooling never got in the way of our success. So all along, that was one of the big concerns, is you know, I, I depend on code completion, right? The, the two big things were refactoring and code completion. And 
at no point in the project, I, I, I mean, I, Jim, I guess, I'll, you know, that I remember, was that ever a dominant problem that we had? The other things that we were trying to solve were dwarfed by anything that, you know, you know, we, but concerns over code completion or refactoring. Having said that, I think um, one of the reasons why refactoring wasn't as big of a deal for us as it could be is because we were coding in a functional style, right, where you pass data in, you're passing stuff back out with no side effects. So, you know, the method itself, so what, what ended up happening is you might have to change things kind of at the endpoints of a call chain, but if you're just passing values around and you don't care where those values live on what objects, the, the whole point of refactoring um, didn't become the issue that it could have been. Um, and, and I think it was a coding, I think, again, we got lucky. It was, you know, we didn't have the tooling to support it and we were coding in a style where it, it didn't become a big issue. And I remember this very distinctly because there was at one point where, we, I mean, we were truly doing iterative, incremental, agile development and a year or so into the project, we knew a lot more than we did when we started. And there was at one point, I remember working a whole weekend trying to refactor how we were doing some things because we were just going down a wrong path. And I expected it to be really painful. And, um, and because of the dynamic typing, I, I remember this very distinctly, the dynamic typing and the fact that our methods were small. Again, we were passing values in, returning values out. It was just kind of at the endpoints of the call chains that, that we had to manually you know, get that coding right. And because we had the tests in place, when it blew up, we, we could figure out, oh, I forgot to, you know, I renamed something to something else. And when we ran the test, it blew up. It just wasn't. Um, you know what, I, and, and this might be me, you know, I'm, I'm also the guy that doesn't use debuggers a lot and uses print line statements, so, um, you know what, I, I, and, and I, take the meth, I take the lines of code, move it down, and, and give it a name, right. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. And for, for me, it's not, and especially on an app like this, okay, where I'm spending a lot of time trying to understand what's going on, the time it takes to do that, it, it's, I'm not saying that it's not valuable to have a tool that does that, but again, it's like the code completion. Is it more convenient to have it than not? Yes, but at the end of the day, it's like once you're, you're in there working with the domain, it just, I, I can't explain why. I, you know, it's like one of those things I can just, I can report my experience. It just, I, rem, I was in the same camp as everyone else, right? I wasn't looking forward to using Groovy. I was fearing the lack of tooling. And once I got into it, we were using JEdit and Ant for the first 12 to 14 months. And you know what? It just wasn't, I, I would have never believed it. Although, I, you know what? I, I mean, maybe people will believe it now. I mean, how many people have gone back and started using um, uh, Sublime uh, text editor, you know, instead of a, a heavyweight IDE? I mean, Yeah, I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's this trend, I mean, definitely, that I've seen at least, where people are trying to reduce the complexity of their tool set. I'm aging myself here, but when I started programming, um, I was thrilled. It was just normal. And it's just that it's like, you know, whatever editor is. Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> A VI, yeah. yeah I mean, no, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you know. Yeah, it just, and, and once you're used to coding that way, yeah, it's, uh, so the, the, the short answer is, um, I think the tooling is better, but for at least for our project and our coding style, it was never a reason why we weren't going to get something done. You know, the, the complexity of the project, trying to figure out creative ways to test things, um, you know, those things dwarfed whatever concerns I had about being in the editor and having this feature, that feature. Like I said, if we were using JEdit and Ant, I mean, that's about as basic as you can get. Um, and I'm not saying you don't want a debugger. I mean, we, one of the reasons why I was building the Eclipse plugin is because at some point we did want that, the integration, you know, and, and, the, and the, the features that it offered. Um, 
the uh, uh, let's see here. So yeah, Jim, this this was this was a big question I had for for uh, for Jim is. I mean, I'm, you know, I stepped away from the project five, six years ago. I was really curious to know, I think we all thought at the time we were building something that could handle growth. I mean, that was one of the, the propositions behind building this complex app is, you know, they need to, the company needed to be able to respond to the marketplace. They needed to be able to get at their data quickly. They needed to be add products quickly. They, you know, they needed to be able to, to you know, yeah, be more responsive. And, it sounds like the code's changed a lot over the last six years. Uh, yeah, the code has changed a lot. Uh, getting back to the tooling just for briefly, I think Scott's uh, short, the short Scott, the answer to your question is, uh, no, you can't refactor very well in Groovy on any of the IDEs that I've used. Um, it is a much more manual process, more because of the dynamic nature, I think, than some of the other things. So I don't actually expect that to get better. And if I, I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question in, as detailed, it is, it's months to get up to speed on the app. I mean, you can chunk it out and, and be productive right away, but to really get your hands around it, it is months. But, but everybody who gets in there, IS or actuarial, is learning the business part of it. They're not learning the coding part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our code base has grown significantly th since 2008. We've added three new products. We've re-engineered uh, several major portions, including how we calculate the renewal strategy. But more importantly than that, f at least every product we've put in has gone through two rate updates. How the division of labor, Scott mentioned that we were gonna hand this over to the actuaries. That's kind of happened, kind of not. Um, uh, the actuaries, in almost all cases, code uh, the rate updates. New products are coded in, uh, are coded by a team of actuarial and IS resources. And when I say the actuarial resources code the, uh, the rate updates, that means they're checking code out of subversion, they're making the changes, they're running the tests, in har they're running that whole block of business through for that product, they're seeing what it does, they're getting together in their you know, actuarial meetings, running the data analysis on those tables and saying whether these rates are doing exactly what we thought they were gonna do or not. And then if they have a technical problem, usually performance at the end or some other thing, they bring us in. And then we all sit down for a code review before a major uh, code change goes in. We try to streamline it a little bit, make it a little more performant if we can. We all sit there and try to tidy up uh, the, the naming conventions, which you know, is a battle onto itself and we've lost, but we keep trying. Um, uh, but. Each product ha follows sim a very similar system, and all of our major refactorings have tried to get each product to be more like the others in how it's processed uh, without bastardizing what we're trying to do within a product to get a correct calc. Uh, and, so, uh, and so it's really a clean working relationship, and we don't have actuarials in the code do this, IS in the code does this. It's, if you're in the code, this is how you operate. And it, it, we don't care whether you're actuarial or IS. That's not that scary. <laughs> no, it's just, it, it seems with tests, it shouldn't be, right? Right, it shouldn't be, but... Um, well, they have a vested interest yeah, in the code base, you know, right? I mean, it's, it's their code. They're the ones that want to Everybody in IS and in 2005 was freaking out a little bit with this, with this model. But the actuaries were freaking out the opposite way. They were, you know, IS was saying, how can you let the actuaries into the CS, you know, or, or at the time we weren't using subversion, we were using CVS. How can you let them into, uh, you know, that repository and have them be, you know, you know, committing code up? They're not programmers. And actuarial people were, you know, not incensed, but they were a little perturbed saying, we are giving, yeah, we own this code. We're giving it to you. You're helping us. We should be in this code. Um, because it's a big giant calculator is what it is. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it has been characterized at times, I think from a little bit of miscommunication as a, uh, as a, 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 a domain specific domain language. Specific language. It isn't. We did not write a DSL. You know, uh, but, uh, 
but with the naming conventions that you saw and kind of how that code would flow, we incorporated their nomenclature, their thought process in, and, and did some things uh, like that. So uh, it reads to them like something that is extremely familiar to them. Uh, even the people who weren't there at the beginning, they get into the thought process pretty quickly, the pattern process, if not the full understanding of what's going on. And IS people are very good at the technical part and gleam onto that, and eyes kind of glaze over at the calculations. Actuarial people really zero in on the calculations, not quite sure what some of this other stuff is going on about. Actuaries are still not completely comfortable with the spring process we've got in place. They understand why it's there and why it's important, but that does not mean they have to like it. And they are, <laughs> and they are quite clear about that. Uh, so, uh, but we're now at 120,000 lines of co code. Uh, we've, in addition to re-architecting different things, we, we used to run uh, uh, to UDB for all of our testing, and we've changed that to Teradata. That's one of the things we've got uh, uh, some uh, real process improvement boost. But we had to change the code for all our uh, SQL that we wrote, and we wrote it. Uh, so our connections were easy, but the SQL differs from one platform to another. And, and when we went, we had to make sure we could identify every difference you know in the code and, and, and we could we would tolerate differences in the rates or in the in the uh, outcoming values if we saw some as long as we could explain them or those differences didn't matter it's all in how you manage the risk you might have a question sure. I have a question for you so well first of all um, I mean I would love to sit, um, I want to go back to that for okay. a second um, I would love to claim that I had, as a technical lead, the vision that this code base would be able to do all of this. You know, when I was, <laughs> I did, I mean, really, I was, I was thinking, how can they change small bits of it? Um, and, um, you know, I guess because I was on the project, I'm looking at this slide, and, and uh, I guess one of the questions I have, I mean, this is, this is an amazing volume of change on a, on a production system. I mean, we started with four products, so they have three, so they've almost doubled, you know, you could think of double, doubled the size of, well, they've tripled the size of the code base, doubled the amount of products that they're doing over six years. Um, and you're doing it with staff that is not, you know, I mean, you're not finding language gurus and, and you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're staffing it with, with normal people. So how, how do, let me ask you this. I mean, I, when I think about what a code base looks like six years after you implement it, I mean, I don't know how everyone else feels like it, but six years of change, I, I'm not probably feeling as great about getting in the code base. How, how is it to work in the code base now compared to when, we, when you first got it? Um, it uh, well, and I should say, um, I only spend about 15% of my time there, and I'm going to be rolling completely off in just a little bit. Uh, so Scott's not there. Of the original development team, uh, only two people are regularly active in the code base. That's two of the actuarial people. All of the IS people no longer full time on that code base. So we've had an almost complete replacement of the core maintenance and development team in that time. And we've still done uh, mine's recent, so I've been through 80, I've been through about 90% of this, but, uh, but the vast majority of this has been done with different people, different faces that we brought up to speed on this stuff. Um, and the code today, uh, there's more of it, but it follows the same format, it follows the same structure, it follows the same sort of thought pattern and naming Convention gives it to, like we actually did it right. Naming style, we'll call it a style. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it's, still, it's still fun to be in there developing. It is still easy to, not, to see the difference you're making in the code base and what you're trying to do. It's still nice to be able to do significant amounts of work in a small team and get a lot of changes in in a hurry. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, we're kind of running out of time, so I'll probably jump uh, ahead a little bit. Um, you want me to go to the next slide? Or? Uh, yeah, let's see what the next slide is. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hit this a little bit. Um, because, you know, a lot of times uh, we wish we had, you know, we wish we had a tight customer 
uh, IS relationship where we could say, you know, that we're on the same page. How, whatever page that is, if, you know, whether it's we're on the same page and it's we're in really bad shape or we're on the same page and things are going well, at least we're on the same page. Uh, and for the most part, we've definitely had that. Uh, so, uh, and we've really been able to work in a code base that is honestly, it's a complicated problem, but it's easy to develop in that, in that code space. It's easy to make changes. It's easy to demonstrate that those changes are doing exactly what you thought they were gonna do. It's fairly easy to prove that for all the cases we've identified so far as important, it does not do something bad that you didn't want it to do. Uh, and when you can do that, and you can do it relatively easily without a lot of politics or, or fear uh, that, that what you are going to change is going to cause problems, it's really a fun project to be a part of. And that's why I, st I was on this project longer than I was on any other project in my career. And it was the challenges that we got to, to solve, the problems we got to solve here, the tools we got to use, and I consider Groovy one of the tools in doing that, and the people and the customers I got to work with in doing that really made working on this a, a, a pleasure, even when the, the results weren't looking so good and the, and the problem seemed difficult, if not insurmountable at the time. Um, uh, one of the things, and Scott alluded to this a little bit before, that uh, people are particularly concerned about with a dynamic language in addition to performance are errors and runtime errors in particular. Now, runtime errors can happen a couple of ways more with dynamic language. The obvious one is because they're dynamic, you create, uh, you declare your variables dynamically, you don't get the static support. So things that would have obviously blown up in the compiler step sail right on through to runtime, and that's bad. But there are other kinds of dynamic language things that because variables are malleable, you put them in if statements and you compare them, you do things like that, you don't always get the results you expect. And those don't show up in runtime errors. Those necessarily, they can, but they can also take you down a path you didn't think you were gonna go, or just as bad, uh, not, go, not go anywhere, not go down a path you expected to go down. Um, and, <coughs> and that is, and if you so, and you've heard that we have a lot of methods that are really long. And so really long is not just really long, it's really complicated with a lot of ins and outs, if statements, complicated if statement uh, setups that can depend on not just what the state, uh, that, that are very state dependent, the size of the, the, size of the group, the particular uh, selections of the group. So um, the dreaded runtime error, you would think would, would have come up a lot since we've gone into production. And it has come up, but it's only come up about five or six times, less than 10 for sure, in the, since 2005. Um, now what that means, a runtime error means that a user can't, try, can't do what they wanna do to try to sell business for Mutual of Omaha, and it's our fault. It's very clear that the rating engine is not handling something it should. And at that point, we have two choices. We can spend thousands of dollars and, and get everybody else who has to be involved in, in a co, you know, in, into, in an off cycle production involved and move it off cycle. Or, you know, the system is complex, but it's flexible. Usually there are workarounds. Of the five or six times that we've had runtime exceptions in production that we've identified for scenarios that we should have but did not code, Probably two of them on their own were important enough to justify off-cycle changes. You know, so uh, at least two uh, on two occasions since between 2005 and now, the rating engine was responsible for us having to move something into production. Now that wasn't all we moved in because you know how it goes. As soon as somebody is on the hook as being the person that made an off-cycle happen, Everybody else tries to get everything that they wanted in because there's a there's something going to production. Let's get it, you know. And so, <coughs> and so that happens. And some of the times uh, we've been able to get off the we've gotten stuff in on other people's uh, uh, problems that have caused a need for an off cycle. But 
and off cycles are super embarrassing, especially for a dynamic language, uh, uh, because it is so clear to everyone that but for static, uh, static typing, this would not be happening. You know, it is just obvious that but for your decision, whenever you made it, and you know, it's all well and good, but nobody likes off cycles, and they do cost a lot. Even the, it, it's a financial thing, but it also causes everybody to have to stop what they're doing, who, who get involved in all of this, package stuff up and send it out. And it's a pain. Um, and it's not, it, you know, it's a bad, it's a bad face, customer facing thing to have. So I don't take it lightly when I say I don't spend any time worrying about these errors because these errors mean next to nothing to me compared to the real errors that a rating and pricing engine needs to worry about, you know. Something we can't quote is something we don't sell. And that is bad, assuming we've priced it right. But it's nowhere near as bad as rating and pricing something wrong and selling it like gangbusters going out the door. You know, that is what is very concerning to me. And the fact that we use a dynamic programming language does to some degree on one hand increase the odds that maybe we do that, not with the runtime exceptions, but with things like if statements that don't work right. So maybe you bypass a calculation you were supposed to make, or, and you're given something for free. And so that changes the rate in some way, shape, or form. And that that rate slips through, and all of a sudden people see that a certain you know, option is relatively free. <laughs> You know, and so all of a sudden we see a spike in that activity. Now, we have not seen anything like that. I am just relating to you things that the actuaries warned us they were concerned about when we did that. And, the fa and as we sit here tonight and I confidently say, I feel good about where we're at. I don't, dispute, I don't discount the fact that what I'm afraid of might be ticking away in our code base right now and I don't know it. You know, that's, but, that would happen in Java too. That would happen. It might not be as likely, but there's no code base you can. Or there's no coding language you can code in to say that's not going to happen. The fact that this particular example of how dynamic languages might make it more possible in this particular instance is is absolutely in my mind true. But to counterbalance that, you have the readability. So you don't have a you don't have a 200 page requirements doc of actuarial calculations that gets passed in for somebody to read and try to code in Java big decimal or somebody to look at in Java big decimal to try to see if that's accurate. So Jim, do you think that the fact that the um, the actuaries can do the rate updates themselves mit helps mitigate that Absolutely. risk of getting the calculation wrong? Absolutely. Uh, or, and even when we were doing it, we were pair programming with an actuary by our side uh, frequently. Because that's pretty amazing yeah. for six years if you didn't have something like that pop up. You know, no, to knock on wood, we have not had anything like that, you know, uh, uh, happen. Now, co the coding problem, you know, you know, it's the black swan problem. It, coding it right is one thing, testing it accurately, Making sure what you coded is actually what you moved into production and not some wrong version that's an amalgamation of different, ver you know, you know if, if the wrong version of SVN gets moved in, you know, I mean, there are many ways in which this can kind of go south. Uh, and you've got to build the protections for all of it. But with a dynamic language, one of our main things is SME read the actuaries being able to read and understand what's going on. So we get the miscommunications to a minimum. And it's amazing how many miscommunications you can still have. Even with that, oh, it's just amazing. I mean, we catch things in test, heading toward, pre I mean, on the path to production that, uh, that as we all look at it, we were like, how did that happen for so long? You know, and we've all been there with that. But the nice thing about being a, on the rating and pricing engine is you directly affect the financial well-being of Mutual of Omaha and its customers. You know, you price it right, you rate it, you rate it right, you price it right, you're giving everybody what they expect, and you're positioning the company to be able to match what they promised. You know, 
you are not creating a scenario where there's going to be this big black hole for Mutual of Omaha that's going to put my job, the company, anything at risk. And that's really, we're a very conservative company. There's no, no risk there. But it's, it's rare in IS, especially at the enterprise level, that you get that close to making a difference as to the actual bottom line with one team and 120,000 lines of code. And so, it's a res and so that's why uh, we think that dyna this dynamic language in this particular instance is a huge boon toward making it a safer, more accurate uh, calculation, despite our possibility of like runtime exceptions and things like that. So I know we're almost, uh, we're kind of running out of time here. I, I had a quick question for you though, Jim, on do you think, uh, I know there's other places um, I, I know there's other places at Mutual that have used Groovy um, and Grails in the six years since, or seven years, whatever it is, since this went into production. Um, you you want to talk briefly about sure. that? Um, we've done a lot. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, when we, we, were, we are still a Lotus Notes operation, and we had a lot of Lotus Notes databases, and when the, but we're in the process of getting rid of those and have mainly done that. And one of the uh, technologies that we've adopted to replace some of the functionality of Lotus Notes has been uh, the Grails databases. Other actuarial areas have taken what we've done here and really run with creating their own harnesses and a lot of their own calculations, models, and things like that in Groovy. We are, as a company, uh, uh, using Groovy uh, in more and more instances, not in a particularly uniform me method yet. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> I know Jeff, before he went on to Northern Natural Gas, uh, tried to uh, get a lot of uh, people to adopt Spock and use Groovy for more unit tests than Mutual. That's a battle we're still fighting in the larger uh, Mutual of Omaha community, but more and more people are, are writing the test. We've now got Jenkins with continuous uh, builds and the ability to kick off the, uh, the, the regression test suites and all that. So it's, it's coming more online. Um, but as I said, we at, at, for, a for a long time were, uh, were stuck on Groovy 1.5.5 with Java 1.4. So when Grails and some of these other areas started to adopt that, they didn't have those limitations. They were using the latest and greatest. And um, one of the people who was in charge of sort of making sure we had support contracts, Mutual of Omaha, as a, as a fiscally responsible company, always concerned that there was no support should we struggle with Groovy in some way other than the open source community just from a financial and they, they wanted to have somebody they could call up, write a check and get them in who could commit something or do something to fix our problem should that arise. We knew how well the community had treated us on the team so we weren't as concerned. But when Groovy and Grails uh, came in and, uh, and, and the G21 team came together and then became uh, Spring Source and then Pivot, uh, the project manager who was in charge of some of these, uh, these uh, support contracts for various technologies came to me and said, good news, we're going to get uh, Groovy support. So um, I just want, I want you to be a part of that because that'll really, you know, that'll, uh, I know that'll make management feel good about where the rating, t the rating engine is because it uses so much Groovy. And I said, well, I don't think we need to get, I don't think we, we should get it for Groovy because I don't think it'll, it'll do us any good. And she said, why not? And I said, we're on 155. They're up to 18 at the time, about to be on 19. Or excuse me, they were on 17, about to be on 18. I said, before you buy it for us, ask them if they have a support system for 155 other than for us to move up to 17 so they can support us. Because if they don't, it's not worth it to us. I mean, there's just, we can't go because WebSphere is on Java 1.4. And they, but it, I said, but if, you, if Grails, if we want it for the Grails and the other Groovy projects we've got going that aren't tied to this, that would be fine. And she, and that was exactly the case, that, that, that nobody was going to sit there and make 155 changes 
that we weren't asking for. We were, we were okay. I mean, obviously, everybody wants their stuff to run faster. We wanted to be on Groovy 1718. We weren't asking to backfill that. We were asking to get off Java 1.4. <laughs> you know, you know. Um, yes? Is it, is it by design that you guys didn't create the DSL, or was it just accidental? Uh, the question was, was it by design that we didn't create a DSL, or was it just accidental? This was way too complex. To, we, we always treated it as a software development project that we were just using Groovy and we were just getting the benefits from it. Um, we weren't trying to create some sort of, of DSL for any kind of plug-in that, that they could just then uh, tap in. Um, you know, 85% of our code base, eh, 80% is the business rules. And if you think about most, and um, that's off the top of my head, uh, but you know, or I should say of the non-test harness code is business rules, but that's still, you know, probably 50,000 lines of business rules. And that is a ton of business rules. I have a quick comment on that. The uh, people have asked a lot about the, over the years about the DSL part. Um, we didn't create one because we didn't need to. The, the business logic that we really cared about for readability was, you know, we had operator overloading for the math formulas. And then really everything else was collections. You had collections of people or collections of products. So if I can go products dot each product dot each product option, I mean, I don't know what I would create in a DSL other than get rid of the dots, you know, to make that more readable. So from a, the, you know, the collection classes were rich enough and the math support was rich enough. And really that's where, you know, 80, maybe even 90% of the code is. And so there wouldn't have been much value to trying to create a DSL. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap it up? Uh, this was only supposed to be an hour long talk, so as usual, <laughs> we're horrible failures. Uh, I just had one question. So you kind of started this project before Grails uh, was around, right? But you had Groovy in front. What, uh, what did you guys use for an interface in front of the, the rating engine? What, what, what does the user use to get to the rating engine? Uh, well, the question is, what does the user use to get to the rating engine? It uses the Java, if it's a true user, it uses the Java uh, front end, that IDE that Scott talked about. So, it's a, it's, it's a, so the front end is an Eclipse rich client platform app that talks to WebSphere at, at the time using EJBs. So they took the code we had and wrapped it in an EJB. But it was that the front end was really all that Eclipse rich client. And then there were database um, services and controllers on the WebSphere side. Yep. Now, performance is such a concern to us that uh, we keep all of our calculation items in resident memory. So we don't, we, we are, from, from the, the GSAP application standpoint, we are state neutral. Within our app, state is important in some to some degree, not state of, of um, uh, not state in the sense that, uh, you know, Scott was saying we're a little more, we are very functional in our programming, but uh, order matters in how we're doing some of the things we do and things like that. So, uh, <coughs> pardon me, but uh, the harness that Scott was talking, uh, we've talked about this test harness that we kick off. One of the ways we do that is an, uh, an Eclipse uh, uh, plugin that Scott started and we've built out since uh, he went. So you're in a, you're in Eclipse, uh, either running the GSAP uh, rich client, or you're in. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that would yeah. You're in, or you're in Eclipse as an actuary or an IS developer running the harness, which is an Eclipse plugin. Any other questions? I don't remember doing that. You did, <laughs> yes. And it served us well. We didn't have to really tweak it. Uh, until we went, until we got off of, uh, we went up to uh, uh, jo uh, Groovy 1.8. And now, now we're actually on Groovy 2.1. We, we went to 1.8 and we went, went from uh, 1.55 to 1.8. That took us uh, five years. Going from 1.8 to 2.1 took us two months. Well, there's no other questions. Um, Jim, thanks a lot for sharing this. This has been interesting for me to hear what happened. It's kind of, as a consultant, I guess you don't always get to see what happens to the code that you live, or that you wrote in the project that you left. And 
it's been it's been really interesting. I appreciate you being able to share this. Well, and I want to thank Scott for he he did he was the lead engineer on this project. It scaled very well. Groovy is one of the reasons. The people were the other. The technical. Oh, Almost everybody had some programming knowledge. The IS people who came to it had a lot of programming and problem solving knowledge. They just didn't have a lot of Java knowledge and they didn't have any groovy knowledge when they came to it. It wasn't like there were a bunch of people, you know, and I, I think Scott got a little irritated at some po points, so uh, I can share Scott's story, that'll be good. Um, you know, <laughs> because he was like, uh, you know, because actuaries are very smart and we had very smart people working on it. Uh, and to some extent, uh, I think he, and I'm putting words in his mouth, he thought that was stealing Groovy's thunder a little bit because uh, I think they were getting all the credit for picking up on this so quickly and, and Groovy was getting none of the credit for making that transition uh, as seamlessly as it could be, uh, you know. And honestly, that's a problem when you try to, we've tried to bring Groovy out to some other places in the organization and they have, when we say we have great, we have great experience with customers embracing that, they say actuaries are different, you know. Yeah. But we've seen Groovy work in other areas. Uh, so yes, actuaries are different. They can work in a 120,000, you know, line coded application. We are not expecting any other business people to do that. That makes actuaries different. Not that they can do Groovy and other business people can't. So this was, a less technical talk, we, but hopefully you've got some fodder if you're trying to get this or any other dynamic language uh, you know, through a corporate environment that is less than accepting at this point. Uh, maybe there is some food for thought here or you know, this video can convince somebody. Thank you.